much for attending. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, everything that I say has to be not necessarily taken as HP's views, let's be clear, um, because I'm a bit of a renegade. But I took a starting point of I am relatively known for having, uh, on the kind side, passionate rants. On the unkind side, uh, aggressive, irritating statements about things that are happening in our industry. Um, so I come from what is now actually uh, an academic bent because I'm doing a PhD in information assurance. And so you have to read stuff, you have to learn stuff. I've been doing that for a very long time. And I get quite passionate about the fact that people stand on platforms and people discuss an industry and people write in the media about all the things that they don't know. How about going reading a book? That might be a good start. So I wanted to set the tone of the day as being, all right, there will be a lot of reference to cyber, but it's not new, it's not different, it's not particularly scary. We know what it is and how to solve it to a large extent. Everybody will have an opinion about how to argue and disagree with that, but I'm going to throw it out there. So you would have read that. Um, it's been a hugely interesting week. And I just thought I'd you know, make sure we wedge that in because there'll be a lot of reference to various research and reports we should all be aware of. And there's always something to read about this. There's always somebody writing something about it and clearly somebody tweeting something about this. Stuff. Um, it struck me as uh, mildly ironic that it would be South Korea having the experience and in a very short space of time the news is that it's North Korea doing it to South Korea. You have to sort of be um, aware of the politics within which you are operating in the cyber space. It's about the geography, the geopolitics and the political landscape in the space where the threat is happening. That's what cyber is about. But when you actually do a Google search for cyber in the top things that come up, I was pleased to say actually in the first page, the top 20 controls from SANS, but actually linked from our own UK government CPNI, the Centre for the Protection of the National Infrastructure. Good for us. So, and CPNI has been around for a very long time but they have a good description and explanation of those 20 controls, and I'm, again, going to be pedantically irritating in as much as we know how to do this stuff. And when you dig into the background of what was happening to South Korea last week, well, it was an attack on things that should have been being addressed and solved. We know how to do the solutioning. So, and in fairness, that's some of the space that certainly HP are in. So hence, our response should be simple. We're not afraid. We have the practice and technology. So, stepping back into academic mode of, there is always something to read and learn. I liked these two relatively balanced statements from different generations. It would be nice if people actually understood what they were talking about when they decided to be quite vociferous about the area. The number of people I meet in this industry who say, well, I don't really understand information security, or I don't understand information insurance, or information governance. There is a truckload of stuff written about this. Go and find it out. Do not stand on a platform and say you don't understand it. Do not write about it if you don't <coughs> understand it. Go and read this stuff. We're in a place of learning. This stuff is available. It really, really is. So hence, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge, where people write about stuff, say, well, you know what we need to do? And it's from a premise of not actually understanding the background. Those of you who know and have been through academia, you do not pass go from certainly PhD world without having read everything there is to know in order to stand firm on your platform to say, right, so I'm saying the gap is here. Feel free to challenge me. Uh, so. Um, I deal in a world that is very much, all right, well, we have all our stuff, don't we, Andrea? And I, <laughs> well, you think you do. Uh, you've got 15 years' worth of it, and I'll show you where all the gaps are. 
Um, and we end up dealing with what is very much appearing to a lot of the people I'm working with um, as the Library of Babel, because they've got loads of stuff and they cannot sort wheat from chaff. They cannot work out what is it they need to do. And they also look at it and go, by assumption, it must be out of date. It doesn't mention explicitly cyber or cloud. It must be out of date. Uh, why? Doesn't it actually get founded on a principle of let's just keep it safe and secure? So it's just trying to be reiterative and realigning people to what's actually meant by the information being shared. So it just strikes me as, well, this is an old flow, but we need to understand everybody you talk to who gets this will go, but it's about the information assets. What are those assets? What is it you have that needs to be protected? How are you going to go about protecting it? Not, well, well I threw everything out in the cloud. Should I have been worried? It's a bit late to ask the question afterwards. Ask it before. Where is it? Where is the cloud? It's not up there in the sky. Your stuff is on a box in a data center somewhere. It's still on tin, ultimately. It's not in something fluffy in the ether. It is still on tin, and the tin still has to be looked after by, ultimately, a human has to intervene with some technology. So all of that landscape needs to be understood, and you have to understand all of those elements of it and to it. So it's very important <coughs> that people know these things rather than coming at it from one of the angles of this. So going through the historicals, I was at some very interesting talks last week, and because we're um, out of region, as it were, because you know everything only happens in London, um, so it's brilliant to be here with you today. Um, lots of meetings in London last week, uh, which was just a great sanity check so that I knew I could come here and confidently say all that I'd wanted to say. Um, but somebody rightly brought out that if you look at uh, Sun Tzu, and many people do in this space, it's all been written at least that far back. Uh, but my PhD work has taken me through the journey of, I, I'm specifically looking at the information assurance space, why did we use that term um, at a time when very quickly then everybody used the cyber term. And my huge concern has been the cyber term, as I've said, is only a part of the space. It is not the space. So looking through, I was trying to put a sort of a timeline on it. It's not <coughs> accurate, because I'm going to do more work on this. But it just gives a flow of the changes of terminology that people have settled on as we go through. And my biggest concern is that there are people who are going to come into the industry and live through a generation that will only refer to cyber in error. I will stand here happily, put my salary on it, that they will end up referring to this in error. And for as much as the rest of the day is going to be spent explaining all the things that need doing and how to improve it and what we're getting wrong and all the solutions, we'll be doing it in error if we keep referring to it in the cyber domain as it were because it's bigger than that. It is just a part. To that end, I was reminded by a colleague I worked with on this particular activity with what was then the DTI and has been through many changes since, but is now BIS, the Business Innovation and Skills Department of Government, the Cyber Trust and Crime Prevention Foresight Program, Foresight, thinking about things before they happen. Ultimately, we started 12 to 13 years ago on this and published the report in 2004, so its 10th anniversary will be next year. Everything we said in it is, mm, surprise, surprise, happening. So we had the foresight to know this is what will happen. Here are the solutions. <laughs> Hell surprise, not all solutions were implemented. So the stuff is not new. It is, has been thought about, and it's this whole generational aspect of when people come in. So you have to go back to the basic principles of, okay then, if that's the case, what is it we're supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be preserving the information assets for people, looking after information, making sure it stays safe, what's there is reliable, and is protected from all threats, including the cyber threat. And the cyber threat has to be understood 
from your perspective of how likely is it I'm going to be a South Korea? What is it that I've got that they might be after, whoever they are? And is it actually that I might just be the jumping point, the transition point through because of my exposed systems for them to use me as the conduit to do whatever they want? So I've given you a, a US versus UK just for linguistics because we work globally and we have to understand <coughs> what the nuances of the language differences are between each geographic domain. My role in HP is global and I'm having to try and create a global platform of we will all remind ourselves it's about this and we all have to report security issues, incidents, events, call them what you will, in the same way. From a platform of there are corporate objectives, there are executive goals, executive requirements, executive management want, of course, the one page pretty slide of everything's green. They don't want to know all of what's going on underneath to get to that because they just want to know how safe are we, how secure are we. How likely is it that this threat is going to impact us? And preferably, that be green. It's not going to. I said last year to my management, but we'll never be 100% secure, we'll never be 100% risk-free. That might be why I didn't get a bonus last year. That didn't go down well. I said, oh, right, sorry, the truth. Well, you don't want to hear the truth. Okay, note to self because they don't. They fundamentally want to be wrapped in cotton wool and say, it's all right, everything is kept confidential. The integrity is intact. It will always be available. Utter nonsense. None of these things are true. There is no such thing as 100% security. We will never be 100% risk-free. All shot down in place. True. Fundamentally true. That's why we do what we do. It's why we continue to do what we do. It's why we all have jobs. <laughs> because we will never be 100% of any of those things. But we have to keep a flow going and be able to evidence that what we're doing is worthwhile, has value, has meaning, and is not wasting money. Hmm. The cost conundrum. So ensuring everything that we're doing is in the assuring space. And that's the activities we all have to get up to. I'll come to that. So it, it sort of translates across what are the flavours. If you were to talk to the UK Information Commissioner, very, very strong on, look, you all know encryption is available as a technology. Explain to me, justify to me, why in all cases you can't encrypt everything all the time. At rest, in transit, in motion, whatever phrase you want to use, what's your problem? You've got technology available to encrypt things. And it's quite expensive. Right, so you're not prepared to pay for security, but you know that's actually the solution. Well, then you have to deal with the hit when I come to you and say, here's your fine. So that's the game business is playing. We all know that's the Information Commissioner's UK view. You don't do it, smack on back of legs and more noughts these days. And it's going to be even more noughts because, of course, as of whenever we actually go live with the implementation of the new EU approach, data protection registration, no fee, huge millions lost from the Information Commissioner's budget line, they'll go after this more because they'll need to get fine money back in, won't they? So that's always top of the consideration. And the number of projects that don't have it included just makes me want to cry as a security professional. And that's the challenge you have. You know in your heart as a security professional what should be being done. Business makes the decision whether to do it or not. And you have to swallow, write the note down that says, I advised them, put it in that bottom drawer that gets bigger and bigger of all the things you have advised them of. That's your role, just to advise. You can't force them, lead the horse to water or drown it. Can't always be done. So, all those things in place, integrity. My husband is the armchair uh, HP man. Um, 
and is the sort of the common man, so gets asked all these questions, and he says, all right, so my role today is I'm CEO of a big company. What do I need to know? He says, I just wanted to keep my information, uh, integrity was the word he was struggling for, uh, trying to remind himself of the many acronyms I've thrown at him over the years. Um, and actually, integrity and availability came out higher on his list of requirements as a fake CEO uh, than confidentiality until I reminded him about it, but I and the A. And it's interesting, some organizations will always be somewhere different. Medical organizations, healthcare information, confidentiality potentially higher than integrity and availability. Everybody is somewhere different on these three and the requirements of them. Slides available afterwards, you can read. I'm not going to read everything on slides. Um, availability. When we talk about we, um, moved in the same way as we've gone through a transition of terminology to end up wrongly uh, in the cyber domain at the minute with uh, business continuity moved to resilience. And resilience is the term that is about saying we can bounce back from any event that happens to us. And it's that bounce back ability of an organization. Well, is that really what we're able to do with our availability um, structures and frameworks we're putting in place? The more home working we allow, yes, particularly given our weather challenges. Um, so keeping stuff private, keeping information where it needs to be, all of that information, security, fundamentals, those are the principles we have to remember to work to, irrespective of advanced persistent threats in the cyber domain. Because when you look at all the reports from last year in the Verizon and Poneman, etc. area, they all effectively, you get the feeling everybody went, ooh, right, cyber sounding sexy, that's what's selling in the media, find and replace information security with cyber, that'll do it, put it out as the latest version of everything. But fundamentally, when you look at the detail, it's still about people weren't patching things, people still had vulnerable systems, people still weren't doing these fundamental things. So why not? Because it's not being understood in a putting it all together way. And that was the, the, the growth from information security to assurance was about saying, we need to be able to assure our management, our customers, our clients, our people, that we are protecting the information assets that have been entrusted to us. And that's what the assurance usage of the term was about in the insurance world. Insurance as an industry just hasn't taken off in this space. It might do the more fines become a part of our life. Sony, big breach, huge fines. It's not put them out of business. It's not stopped people using them. It just slightly, slightly shifts the dynamic for a while. It has an impact on share price at the time. But everybody moves on. What would really, really affect us all? We are now at the point of we expect, assume, somebody's going to do something stupid with our information. Most people are already putting most of their information out there anyway. Through Facebook, through Twitter, what do people really care about protecting these days? Financial information, probably. But needing to join it up, certainly the US in particular headed off down a right GRC. That's going to be our next acronym of choice for a while. And that's a space that still dominates. But again, technology has been allowed to dominate the space because you have GRC technology to manage everything. So it's not about a technology system. It's about a system of systems. And it needs to be interconnected across the whole of the organization because it's about the reporting. Um, I had to refine the link for the security policy framework, but again, it just was to, to show the link between HMG, Her Majesty's Government. I was speaking with a colleague at a dinner last week, and he said, to never be the person in the room who wants to know what HMG is if you're in a cabinet meeting. Her Majesty's Government, just in case there's anybody in the room who doesn't know HMG. SPF, Security Policy Framework. So uh, this has been the sort of set of things that government at large cascading down to local government would look at, and GR and C were at the top of that, so I was pleased to see that, um, but equally felt that by having it as one of, said it runs through everything, so why would you call it out as a separate thing? And that's part of our challenge. We always dissect everything and then have a vertical for everything, and we don't see it as interconnected, and that's part of our collective failing in the industry. 
because we need to work in these kind of circular, cyclical. Everything needs to knit together. You end up with people who deal with risk, people who deal with compliance, people who deal with the technical security bits, and they don't talk to each other, and they're not sharing the information they are finding out, the incidents that are happening. How do you know whether you are under attack or not if it's not being shared across, up, down, through? You're just not getting the visibility and the understanding across all of these elements of your landscape. There was an article, um, and, and I have a burning need to blog quite negatively about it, so I have to balance that's career limiting, um, that we have a huge need in the industry for 300,000 more cyber security professionals. Really. How about the current professionals just getting more genned up on stuff? What's the problem? Why don't we just know our stuff? Um, where, where, where are we going to get these people from? Why would they want to join in this industry of muppetry? What, what would make you want to join us? Why would you want to do this for a career? I just want to run a and b I don't, I don't get it. So, um, the, you know, the perception that there's a gap. There's a gap because people don't see this and they need to be able to, made to see this sort of whole of whole, system of systems. That's it, you know. We've made it so complex. We have acronym overload to the point of it just makes you want to hurl every time there's another one. Um, new CIO joined HP. I gave him my now, uh, it's I think 16 pages worth of acronyms. I'm only at HP 18 months and I started at day one. Um, and that's just our HP version of the world. It's ridiculous. And I know that in every industry, if we were in the medical industry, we'd have terms about terms about terms. But we take it to a ridiculous degree in the IT industry. What? Just for... Stop swearing on stuff. Giggles. Um, so, information health and information being the oil of the, the 21st century. It's all this dialogue around the value of the information. That's why people are doing what people are doing in terms of getting information and getting access to it. And trying to work out the why and the wherefore, the people who do the, the state-sponsored crime and all these things, that's where the money is. And there's more money in that than in solving it at the minute. So, and that's been the case for quite some time. It certainly was throughout the foresight work. So you need to know what your risks, concerns, and issues are and do it on the basis of your likelihood and your cost impact and your damage to reputation stuff. So that's risk management area. We have to manage our risks better because we have to understand them better. And you can't get over that. People talk in this space without doing the risk assessment piece. Oh my goodness, you know, the world's going to end. All of this cyber threat is so massive. We need all of these people to help us deal with it. It's like, can you just calm down a minute, people? Can you just have a look and just see? Is it actually a threat to you? Where's your information? How is it protected? What have you done? Is your front door locked? Is your are your windows secure? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, then it's not a big threat to you, is it? You know, there are things you can be doing. It is not the world is ending, the sky is falling in. And the use of security as a project, risk management as a project, don't like it, don't like it, drive it out. It can't be because projects end. This is supposed to be part of the DNA of your organization. It shouldn't end. It should exist throughout. So it has to become a program of activity to be ongoing, to be part of the lifeblood. Do not accept things as being set up as a project because if management expect it then to end, here's the report, hand it over, job done, great, we're secure. <laughs> Got to manage it ongoing. So doing those things and doing those things iteratively. What have we got? What's the value of it? Value of information assets, nobody likes doing it. Classifying them, nobody likes doing it. But what's the point? If you've got this stuff, what's the value of it? Um, at the RSA conference, they were asking all the people attending, you know, what would your top tip be? And one guy rightly put it, he said, you know, don't protect a $500 horse with a $5,000 fence. It's that kind of approach you need to think about. Absolutely spot on. Stop spending the hundreds of thousands of dollars, pounds, 
your rules, what's left. Um, if it, the actual asset isn't worth it, we probably have, you know, big data, big pile of in a big bucket. Really, are we going to get the value out of it? We're keeping so much stuff and people do not have data hygiene. Absolutely not. Because we have so much storage available to us, file and forget, file and forget, file and forget. Nobody's tackling their inbox, never mind anything else. So that's all in that space because there is a cost equation to it and it cannot be ignored. And effort. And every time you come to these discussions, effort makes for headache, makes for, mm, let's do something else. Let's go for coffee, because actually that's too hard. And people don't want to do it. And so we are going to continue with these problems because people don't want to tackle the hard homework. So are we all going to accept that people don't want to do it? Who's going to be the one that makes them? Who is the parent in all this who's going to make people do the hard stuff? Who's got the big stick? Um, the risk language has changed, and that, that's certainly been interesting to see over time. Um, the use of capacity, tolerance, target, and limit is part of that space of, well, if you do do some of that hard work, you have to understand it in context then of how far are we prepared to go? Because what is my appetite for saying, no, I'm not bothered. It doesn't matter to me, me, the organization, but who cares if that's what I think? Because you are not alone. We are none of us working in a vacuum. We are part of an infrastructure, so we have to understand what's the impact if I make that decision on behalf of an organization. So I need to understand it in that context then. So what else do I have to bear in mind? Oh, the reputation, yeah. What I've got to comply with. Who's investing in it? And what else is going to actually be part of that sort of reticence of others mightn't accept my choices? So you can't be very renegade about this. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Slides available afterwards. Don't panic. Um, found this, refound this, just to sort of say, again, it's in this space of understanding. People are being neglectful of what they should be doing. And um, you get this doing the sort of PhD world of, I'm so, my PhD is ultimately linguistics and semiotics and people aren't reading stuff so they don't understand it and the language we're using is probably turning them off. I'm probably not helping um, and I understand that but we are neglecting to do things because of our framework of understanding and the volume of information being thrown at us and fundamentally if it isn't a 140 character tweet I'm not going to read it. Okay, <coughs> but there's volumes you need to read and understand which was my point about oh there's 300,000 people needed in the industry. Oh, and we need more PhD students. You can't afford to wait the three, five, or seven years to get the PhD students through and done and their research out. It's a long process of learning and understanding. You don't get to have the volume of knowledge without a long period of time go by. You don't just wake up and know this. So you need that kind of con context uh, in terms of it not being always about throwing technology at the problem by any stretch of the imagination. It is a combination of aspects and putting those together uh, in order to provide the best mechanism of protection based on your risk decisions. So um, I liked this as a um, rewording of we have to have the controls in place and when you look at what happened to South Korea, um, and you can align it against, okay, so of the top 20 controls, what were they not doing? There's at least two that they were a little bit suspect on. Um, and it's in this area of, so we, we do stuff that's preventive. Um, and if those all worked, we wouldn't need the others. And it's about understanding that's why we put the controls in place. And I'm working hugely across the global space of HP. We have hundreds of controls, and we're trying to sort of shrink that down to what's the most sensible set of controls to work with and dividing them up so we can report more sensibly on them because you've got each legislative regulatory framework has its own set of controls, but they all have strands that are similar. So it's cutting across all those 
Cloud Security Alliance just released their latest version of controls. That cuts across all the HIPAA, 27001, PCI DSS. You can map everything to everything, so doing a big piece of work on that. But all of these controls need to be in, in place and then map against that. It's unbelievably hard to get a version of this that you can actually read. <laughs> How helpful is that? Produce something really helpful to everybody that no version of it. I've printed out a version of it. I can't even read it when it's printed. How am I going to follow this? But actually, I'm going to go off camera, but uh, somewhere down here, and actually up here, uh, compliance vulnerability uh, is the big thing, particularly from a Korea last week point of view. And fundamentally, uh, patch management? Oh, yeah, heard about that. That's probably a good plan. So, Information security programs are all about knowing where are your weak links. There are some really obvious things to have in them. Those things don't go away. In the same way as if we're going to build a bridge, there are going to be some fundamentals about its stability to wit the Millennium Bridge. You know, we know there are certain things that need to be in play for things not to go wrong. So we will have to have a number of core fundamental elements that won't change over time. Lots of people want to come along and say, we've all been doing it wrong, and we need to rethink the whole thing, and we need to revamp it all, and for 20 years we've been getting it wrong. You're like, oh, it's just that for 20 years we haven't actually been doing what we said we should be doing throughout those 20 years fundamentally well. So I challenge that. Um, HP is no less likely to do research in the area. HP has HP Labs, and we have a huge volume of... Uh, significantly eminent research people, of which I'm not one, but uh, you know, eventually when I'm a doctor, Andrew Simmons, maybe I'll have it. Um, but certainly I thought it was interesting that of the things that people are concerned about, it wasn't an explicit cyber mention, it certainly is an explicit cloud mention, but as I say, it's still about articulating back, that's still stuck on a box. Um, so it's risks associated, it's lack of skill. Lack of skill is lack of understanding and education in the space. And that's about who we decide we want to pull off another project to put onto all things security. Why? Why would they just be able to take this up out of thin air of not knowing anything else from any other historical background of knowledge? You have to have quite a volume and depth of knowledge in this. In terms of transferable skills, what, what, what do they look like? And I think there's some interesting work to do in that maturity model of skill um, research and there's a lot of work going on. Uh, we're all involved uh, in industry and in sorting out the national occupational standards for security and that work is going to improve over time and certainly the IASP of which I'm a director is also involved in the um, skills framework work. So you need to be working on a maturity uh, curve of where are you and what are your processes and are they actually telling you what you need to know? If you are concerned about the threat from cyber, um, because it's this whole, it's a domain, air, land, sea, cyber, it's a domain where activity is happening and it's where the crime moved to because it was actually economically more viable for it to be happening there. So you need to be doing it in this way. Manage the security risk have actionable intelligence. We are working very hard across that space collectively because of this, we have so many different ways of reporting incidents and defining incidents and reporting them. So putting that together, you need to know what you're seeing. And know that a physical security incident is one of those, if a butterfly flaps its wings, it could be relevant. So tracking everything and having visibility of it up to the dashboard for the executive management, so integrating it. So that's the kind of space, lots of pretty pictures, but ultimately they have this assess, transform, optimize, manage thing going on um, in HP where we're just trying to pull all the information together to uh, make it make sense. And that's you know, fundamentally what we do. We do a lot of um, uh, consultancy work across that space, I'm just conscious of time. So lots more acronyms, but um, my uh, armchair husband CEO was rightly saying it comes down to, as an organization, what did you ask a supplier to do? What was the original brief? What then got signed up to in the contract? Rest assured there'd be two different things, because a bunch of salespeople will have got involved, 
and a whole different load of language will have got involved and a whole load of stuff from the brief will have got stripped out so that they sold what they wanted to sell to make money and the two may not actually match up. So when the proverbial and the fan collides and you, the CEO, go, what the happened here because that's not what I asked for in the brief to be done, it'll be what got signed up to in the contract. And we can talk all that we like about security, but when and fan collide, what was in the contract is what matters. So we need to bear that in mind in this kind of landscape of all the services you want can be offered to you, but if it got stripped out because you wouldn't pay for it, I worry that the seller, that would be us lot, didn't describe well enough to you what you needed, Hope, hoping that's my new role. Um, there's a real, still a real translation gap between your hopes, dreams and aspirations for what's happening to your stuff and what the vendors are actually doing with it. And I think that's a huge gap that needs to be addressed. With all this lovely marketing fluff that goes on, what's actually happening under the bonnet? Trust is therefore fundamental to that. And are you actually trusting what you're being told? Do you believe it? Do you understand it? Do you understand it? You know, the, the business out there needs to understand what it's being told. And that's hard because it's not necessarily the industry you got into. In the same way as IT and information security people didn't necessarily get into the industry of law, but there's a shed load of law we need to know about. So we have to understand all this and then have models for it. <coughs> Which bits are we going to trust to whom? Who needs access to what? For how long? What's that whole trust model and mechanism going to look like? For who, for why, for when? So just rattling through at the end then, because I want to sow a seed, because I want you to think about this and share some ideas. We had a very interesting discussion. Um, some of us were actually in um, the Royal College of Surgeons, which was the right place to be in to have this conversation. When you think about how we've progressed from, ooh, yeah, washing your hands before you actually operate on someone, that's probably helpful. And then actually wearing gloves, that's probably a next step on. Um, somebody happily, confidently said, oh, well, I switched off Windows automatic updates on their machine at something, at which somebody rounded on them and said, you are now part of the problem, you are not part of the solution. And it's just bearing that in mind that we are all collectively connected in the same way as if we were in a norovirus scare, we might all think twice about shaking each other's hand just now. I've got a cold, don't bother shaking my hand off. Um, I'm doing my best to capture it all. Um, but we know what to do about our own viruses, coughs and sneezes. The equivalent from a cyber hygiene point of view, we all have multiple devices connected to the cyber space. And if we don't have the products, the tissues, the antibiotics on those devices, we are part of the problem, not part of the solution, because we are leaving our collective devices ourselves open to continuing the spread of the virus, as it were. So I want you to have a think about that. Um, so I thought, well, what else do we do then in the UK about that? And lo and behold, fair play to them, Get Safe Online, have this running on their um, website at the minute, Spring Clean Your PC. Not feeling it in the snow, but yes. Um, and it says all the right things you would expect it to say. So there are sites <coughs> out there that do try and line this up, but we are ultimately netizens cyber citizens, um, and that's the domain we all live in. It's like how many people have antivirus on their mobile devices? How many people, well, let's start with have a pin code on them. Is four digits enough? All those kind of things. So that's the space we're in. Um, and that led me to something completely random, which was Pink Fat Thinking. Um, very, very late last night, because um, it's just to leave you with this to think about for the rest of the day, while all the other speakers speak, just about over, sorry. Um, because it's about thinking about things slightly differently. If you know you don't know enough, there are loads of resources. See me after class, I can keep you fed with information to read forevermore. There's plenty out there, but we have to think about things differently. And it's just how you see things and how you reform them in your brain is, is what's important. Thank you very much. One and all.